every Sunday I am reminded in a fresh way how good the good news of Jesus is. And I'm so glad to celebrate that with y'all. Um, not only am I reminded of how good the good news is, I'm reminded of how helpful and strong and relevant God's word is. And so with no shame, but only with great happiness, if you have a copy of the Bible, let me invite you to turn to Psalm 7 as we continue our series, The Psalms, where God is showing us not only how to pour out our hearts to him, how to bring our whole selves to him, and how in Jesus, not only to be heard, but to be accepted and loved and embraced, he's not only showing us how to do that, he shows us that he does it, that he delights to do it, that God is not a begrudging dad, but like David is going to tell us in Psalm 27, even if our fathers and mothers forsake us, the Lord will take us in. That is such good news. Listen very carefully to Psalm 7. It is the word of the Lord. It is good news for us. A Shagayon of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjaminite. Lord, my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Selah. Arise, Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that's in me. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end. And may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, righteous God. My shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a judge who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He's bent and readied his bow. He's prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his name. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Y'all, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, Son, and Spirit, make your word to abound in our hearts and lives. Make us to delight in you in every situation in which we find ourselves. Make us to rejoice along with our brothers and sisters around the world and make us with them to hear and to receive and to trust and to love what you tell us. Make the words that we hear today bear fruit 30 or 60 or 100 times over. Make Effingham County and Chatham and the ends of the earth rejoice in you more because of your word today. Work in us, Holy Spirit. We trust in you and we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Has someone ever gaslit you? Uh, what, what I mean is, has anyone ever told you that you couldn't trust your own feelings, that you were right about something? That you were the liar? In fact, you were the one lying to yourself and to other people when that wasn't the case. 
in Psalm 7, the first words we read are kind of mysterious. We have no idea what the Hebrew word shigayon actually means. We're just guessing. And we don't even know who Cush the Benjaminite is or what he did to David, but what we know from the context of this psalm and what we read in it is he lied about David, and it rocked David. As we experience relational conflict, maybe especially and most painfully on Mother's Day, as we remember what has been lied about us or even to our faces, how does God fit into our lives? Well, what does God have to do with us whenever evil people convince us we're the evil ones, that we are the ones in the wrong when we're not? Psalm 7 shows us. It puts words in our mouth like we keep hearing week in and week out. The Psalms are this baby talk that our Father gives us to say, this is how to talk to me in every season of life. And what we see in Psalm 7 is this. Not only does God give us the words to say on our own and also in public worship, Psalm 7 shows us that He hears us when we say them to Him. And God is not only our our great friend and our great counselor and our helper, Psalm 7 makes it abundantly clear that in Jesus, God is our advocate. He is our defender. He is our judge. Prayer and singing, as we keep seeing in the Psalms, are not just a part of the Christian life. They are the Christian life. As we go to work and raise families and do the rest of life, prayer and singing are how we walk through it. And when we pray and we sing like this, we are living our lives before God. We are walking the path that Jesus blazed for us. This is what it looks like to live the true spirit-filled life. And in Psalm 7, we are invited to bring the evil of the world, even the evil that's been done against us, to the God who is righteous. And if that's a tricky word for you, it, it maybe even has some negative connotations, Every time you see the word righteous in the Bible, just recognize it means the one who does the right thing. God is the one who does the right thing, and he does the right thing by all people at all times. He never is wrong. He never does wrong by people. And that's what this psalm is showing us, really simply in one sentence, that we experience the Christian life when we ask God to do the right thing with evil. David, in Jesus, models in this psalm four phases of doing that, four ways of asking God to do the right thing with evil. And maybe you're thinking of your own life right now, of some sort of suffering or injustice you've experienced, some way that someone has or even is hurting you. God tells us, how how do we tell him about that? What do we do in bringing evil to him? The first thing that we see is this, in the first five verses, that we should clear our consciences. As as we bring our experience, or even the evils of the world that haven't directly affected us, we, we clear our consciences. That's what David does in these first five verses. He's bold enough to ask God to clear his name if his name really does deserve to be cleared. And I, it seems like he thinks it should be cleared, but even so, he, he approaches God with a sense of humility. R- remember back in Psalm 5, we saw that David knowingly prays to a God who is holy, who is different and powerful in only good ways. And he loves those special ways of the Lord so much that he is willing to say to his God, I don't think I'm the bad guy here. But if I am, then I, I deserve for you to do the right thing to me first, before you ever do what's right to others. There are two passages in the New Testament I, I couldn't help but remember as I read David's words. Maybe they're on your minds too, showing us how Jesus, in showing us, his people, how to pray, doesn't change anything about what the Psalms give us. That all of the Bible, the Old and New Testaments, are God revealing himself to us in very practical ways, in in ways that have relevance to us. The first passage 
is Matthew chapter 7, where in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord tells his people, judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye and you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Again, Jesus doesn't change the way God's people pray. He, he would have prayed Psalm 7 himself many times over growing up as a faithful Jewish man. And the Old and New Testaments show us that before you ask for others to be judged by God, come to him with a clear conscience. Come, come with an open heart, willing to be humbled and to experience some correction yourself. I, I think maybe my favorite example of that exact attitude in the whole Bible is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul tells the church that he planted, people who are only Christians because he shared the gospel with them, and who are now really ticked off at him. Listen to how he talks to them in 1 Corinthians 4. With me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you, or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against me, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. And therefore, don't pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. In practice, that's exactly what a clear conscience looks like. It is a freedom from what other people think about you, and it is a freedom to bring your whole heart, your, all of your desires to this holy God. And brothers and sisters, if you follow Jesus and you know that God will judge you, and you know that your judgment is based on who Christ is and what Christ has already done, then you can feel okay about yourself. You have biblical permission to feel okay about yourself. Even if you're not sure whether you're in the right or not. And that's because repentance and faith are always in our grasp. Jesus has dropped them in our laps. They're always there for us. And if you are trusting in Him and you're, you are repenting of sins as best as you can, you can still come to the Lord with a sense of uncertainty. I don't know that I'm in the right, but I know you love me. And I know you will always do what is right. You are the righteous God. And I come to you like that because Jesus offers me the ability to have a clear conscience and to have the humility that David has in Psalm 7. Here's the point of all that before we move on. God is, is just, which is exactly the same thing as righteous. It, it's a wordplay thing. God is just. He does not show partiality. He doesn't play duck-duck-goose with us. He doesn't pluck the daisy to say, I love him, I love him not. Our God is steadfast in his righteousness. And so let's pray the rest of this prayer, asking for God to deal with evil, asking God to do the right thing with evil. But brothers and sisters, let's pray for him to reveal the evil in us, if there is any. Let's ask him to root it out of our own hearts so that we would be careful how we judge others, so that we can have a clear conscience as we talk to him about other people. With that really important thing out of the way, that really important first point, David gets down to business in his prayer. He, now that he's cleared his own conscience in God's presence, he hasn't cleaned himself up before coming to God. He cleans himself up in coming to God. And now that he's poured out his heart there, he's ready to make his big request. He's asking God to do the right thing about the evil being done to him. In Jesus, we ask that of him too. We do it all the time. We regularly ask, secondly, for God to act. Listen to the way God hears David's prayer. Listen to the words that David chooses for us, starting in verse 6. Arise, Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. 
awake for me as if God fell asleep. Verse 8, the Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that's in me. Have you ever told God to wake up? Because apparently he's asleep. Have you ever begged God, or I mean honestly commanded God to do something because it feels like he's a little slow in getting around to it? it? It's been said that the only person in the world who can wake up a king in the middle of the night and demand that the king get him a glass of water is the child of the king. David talks to God like he does because he knows he belongs to God. He is bold, bolder than most of us would even dare to be because he knows his God and he knows his God as his father. Bob Marley saying, people get up, stand up for your rights. Look, look at verse 6. David says, God, get up, stand up for my rights. Get up. Why does God... Why does David ask God to do that? What's going on? Because he knows, verse 6, that God has appointed a judgment, that there is a certain day, unknown to David and still unknown to us, at which time God will apportion to everyone what they have deserved. That, that's not just going on in David's life right here. He's not just saying God will eventually settle this out of court or settle it in court. David believes, verse 8, that all the peoples of the earth will one day be gathered about God, verse 7. I have to point out here that the idea of a final day of judgment is not some weird quirk of Christians. That talking about the day of judgment, uh, of even acknowledging that there is an element of hellfire and brimstone to the Christian faith, that's not some new idea. It's what David believed would happen one day. Even though David lived a thousand years before Christ became a human for us. Were you struck here in, verses, in verse 8 that David would say, God, do right by me because I'm in the right. I am righteous. I have integrity. Now, let's be clear. David doesn't think he's always righteous. He's not coming to God saying, you know, I've got a perfect attendance record here. And I feel like you should honor that. But, but he is able to say that in this particular circumstance he's in, whatever is going on, whatever specific evil is being done to him, God, I'm in the right on this one. I have not done wrong. The, the lies being told about me are, are just false. And so God, judge me in light of how I am in the right this time. Why should God do that? Because verse 9, he is the righteous God, the God who always does the right thing. And because that God is the one who protects David, look at verse 10, protects David as if, as David walks through life, God is the one holding the shield over him. Because that's who God is for him. And because, verse 11, God is a righteous judge, a, a judge who feels indignation every day, verse 11. For those reasons, David can pray, God, do something. Verse 11 is kind of a funny one too, isn't it? Or maybe even a hard one, that God is a God who feels indignation every day. Does that strike you as strange or weird or, or hard to swallow? Does it strike you as offensive, that God is indignant, that he's disgusted? I mean, seriously, we who follow Jesus, should, should we use the Psalms as a model for our prayers and songs when they show that God is furious? Should we use them as models when that makes us really deeply uncomfortable to consider? To paraphrase an ancient Christian who lived long before our culture, long before our modern problems, if you believe what you like in the Bible and you reject what you don't like, it's not the Bible you believe. You believe yourself. That's not that's not the faith of Jesus. We, we accept the whole Bible wholeheartedly, even as we don't understand it, even as we 
come to it with many questions. And even as we admit to this God, I don't understand everything I read. We accept whatever you say because, God, you're right. And if I'm wrong, I know you'll, you'll do right by me. Okay, but without objection, sort of addressed. How do we pray that God would judge the wicked, judge the evil in our world? How do we take that into our own lives? Let me tell you a story that I, I think shows exactly how relevant this is for us in our world today. Um, you, you may not know this. Um, I, I didn't until I, I lived in Europe for a while that um, until the Russian invasion in 2022, the Ukraine had more Baptists than any other European country, both in terms of church membership and in number of churches. But recently, I, I shared this on Facebook, there was a recent article in Time magazine where it was reported that just in the last two years, the Russian army has destroyed 400 Baptist churches. That they have tortured and murdered an unknown number of Baptist pastors as well as church members. The, the areas where the Russian army is in control have forced Baptist churches to either meet in secret under threat of arrest and torture or to replace preaching the gospel in sermons with preaching Russian propaganda about the goodness of the invasion. That, that's, that's the choice being faced. Again, I, I say Baptist just because that's us. But, but that's going on right now in our world. And, and let me put it to you like this. If begging God for justice in that circumstance, the one in which our world is right now, if, if that is offensive to you, if it strikes you that that, that that would contradict the mercy and the love of God to ask him to do right by our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Can I suggest to you, can I tell you what that means to me? It, it means that we need to reconsider what the love and the mercy of God actually mean. Especially what it means for God to be loving and merciful for Christians who aren't us. If your God does not feel anger and indignation at the persecution of his church, if he doesn't love his people enough to be indignant over the treatment that we experience at the hands of the wicked, then your God is not the one David takes refuge in. He's, he's not the one that David has entrusted his whole life to. If, if that is an area of the world and the, the life we live in it, where God's just kind of hands off. Dear friend, consider that you're going to really struggle to find the good news of the gospel in the message of the scriptures. Because brothers and sisters, the true God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, the head of the one holy Catholic apostolic church that we confessed faith in earlier, our God has made Christians into one family. And like a really good father with some sort of dumb, dumb kids like us, he repeats this point many times in the pages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that if one member suffers, all suffer together. Hebrews 13 tells us that we are to remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Do you see how when God looks at our world, the one that he made and the one that he controls still, he doesn't see the problems of the Ukrainian church or the Egyptian church, or the American church as being like totally unrelated. Our God has created one body, one church. And so, one Savior church, let's love that church. Let's love our family. Let's be the kind of people who set reminders on our phones to pray for other believers who are experiencing suffering we can't understand. And if we don't do something like that, it, it just won't come into our minds. Well, we know that we should, we just won't get around to it unless we take some action, if we take some initiative. Let's be that kind of church. Let's be the kind of church that prays on Sunday mornings that our brothers and sisters would be free from wicked governments and wicked neighbors and, and wicked family members who do great harm, not to them, but to us. Because in Jesus, there is no them. Let's pray that this God, whose love for his people makes him angry at their experience of injustice. 
Let's pray that he would, in whatever means he finds good, bring down wicked governments. Let's ask that his power would be seen to be greater than the fury of our enemies, verse 6. If you're wondering what that might look like, rarely do I say this, but as a test I did it myself. If you're wondering what it would look like and how to pray for the persecuted church, you should Google it. Uh, when I did, I, I found a ton of really helpful resources that are put out by other Christians around the world. It, I used it to update my personal prayer list. I, I used it to update our regular prayer plans for Sunday mornings. We are to be people who call on God to act because God does act, especially on behalf of the children that he loves. We, we can call on him to do the right thing because he is the righteous judge. He will do the right thing not only by his people, but also by the wicked who hurt his people. We have to call on God like that. Because what we're seeing next in Psalm 7 is that in the mystery of God, two, two things are true at the same time. These don't contradict each other, so track with me here. Psalm 7 and all of the scriptures show us that God will always, with a certainty, do the right thing. His righteousness cannot be thwarted or opposed forever. He will always do the right thing. And also, somehow, God will only do the right thing in response to the prayers of his people. God is not a set it and forget it God, who's honestly not super interested whether we pray or not. It's not true. Nor is God someone who is sort of chained to his throne, just waiting for us to say the right magic words. He, he has a heart for people. He sure would love to help us, but he won't because we haven't prayed the right way yet. Neither of those mistakes are true, but the gist is true. In verses 12 and 16, we see how God's providence and our prayers meet. We experience the Christian life, thirdly, when we meditate on God's judgment. Listen again to this. If the rest of this prayer has sort of been like a pop song, where it's verse, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse three, chorus, bridge, final chorus, twice. It, if there's a linear flow to the psalm up to this point, we're getting kind of jazzy in verses 12 to 16. This is some Miles Davis stuff right here. Listen to this. If a man doesn't repent, God will wet his sword, sh sharpen it on a grinding stone. He has bent and readied his bow. He's prepared for him, the, the wicked person who won't repent. He's prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Switching picture. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. Happy Mother's Day with that picture. Verse 15, the wicked person makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. Th these verses are just one more reminder, like the other reminders that we've seen so far in the Psalms. God wants us to pray and to sing to him in ways that probably are not natural for us, certainly not all of us. How many of y'all, no, no, no show of hands, this is a, a rhetorical question. How many of us, when we think about God doing the right thing and bringing justice to evil people, how many of us imagine him like a blacksmith sharpening his sword? Or an archer who steps on one end of the bow so he can bend it down and string it, getting ready for battle? How, how many of us think like that? Because that's how David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, prays. In verses 12 and 13. How many of us hear lies, especially just rotten, wicked, particularly destructive lies, and when we think about the liar, we picture them being pregnant? Not, not with a baby, but with evil. That's how David, and later in his human life, Jesus prayed in verse 14. And to take another step back and just look at the whole thing from a 30,000 foot view, how many of us ever pray and sing to God in a way that kind of lets our minds wander a little bit? Because on the one hand, our, our thoughts, 
especially our thoughts about God, do need to be fenced in somewhat by God's Word. Just because we picture God one way doesn't mean that's what He's like. But if we start with the clear teaching of the Bible, like the fact that God does write by the wicked and, and by their victims as well, when we start from there, then the Christian life makes space, not just for our minds and our hearts, but for our imaginations. How, how do we imagine God's justice? Like how, do, how do we practice that sort of free-range, free-jazz, helpful prayer? We saw it in Psalm 1, and we see it again here. We practice that. We put it into action through meditation. And we need to be really clear here. In, in our world, that word meditation often means doing whatever it takes to empty our minds. We, we want to stop thinking about things and just zone out or be clear. But, but that's not what the Bible means by that word meditate. In, in Scripture, meditation means filling our minds with something. Specifically, filling our minds with the truth of God's Word and just kind of mulling it over. Take, taking something true and then looking at it from different angles. Because in, in meditating on the truth, we get a better grasp of it. What's David meditating on in verses 15 and 16? The mystery of God's judgments. The weird, wacky, unexpected ways God does the right thing. Because it's both direct and indirect. When God does right by the wicked, whenever he shows his righteousness to those who don't repent, he, verse 12, personally delivers it to them. At the same time, when he does right by the wicked, it's indirect so often. It's, it's not usually a bolt of lightning that brings justice to them. It's what we might call the supernatural natural consequences of their sin. For us who know the Lord Jesus, nothing is natural if that means it happens without God personally intervening. The scriptures tell us over and over again that nothing comes to pass without God making it come to pass. God controls the ends. He gets us to the finish line he wants us to get to. But in some mysterious way, he controls the way that we get there. He, he, he personally directs the outcome, the ends, as well as the means. And in this case, David meditates on God's justice. And he says that the wicked fall into the trap that they set for themselves. Verse 15. That the wicked get clobbered with the hammer that they actually swung at somebody else. God's providence. I use that word again. When I say that word, I just mean the way that God's sovereignty ends up crashing into our world. How his sovereignty affects our real life. God's providence is such an amazing thing to meditate on. We will never run out of opportunities to consider again, what does it mean for God to run the world the way he does? Because I never would have guessed. I, I love the story of a man named Roman Tursky. Uh, Mr. Tursky was a Polish pilot in the early 1900s. Um, he happened to find himself in Austria in 1938 when the Nazis annexed, invaded Austria. And before he escaped himself, he met a stranger in downtown Vienna and found out that this stranger was a Jew and was in great danger. And so Tursky pulled some strings and helped this Jewish man escape right before the Nazis closed the window of opportunity. Several years go by. Um, Tursky uses his skills as a pilot and volunteer, volunteers. He enlists himself in the British Royal Air Force. And in the Battle of Britain, his plane is shot down fighting Nazis. Um, his injuries are severe. In fact, when he gets to the hospital, the field hospital, the staff surgeon passes him over, just doing triage. There, there was no point in trying to save him from his injuries. But Roman Tursky lived because... In this field hospital, in the middle of England, there just so happened to be a world-renowned brain surgeon who had escaped from Vienna, Austria in 1938. The man that Roman Tursky had saved 
becomes the man who saves Roman Tursky. God loves to work through irony like that. God, God, if we can put human emotions on God, that just really sends him off. It's a good day for God. When he can use irony and seeming coincidence to run the world the way that he does. In situations like that, in situations that we could tell ourselves, they force us and the people around us to ask, who makes things turn out so very differently than the way we would imagine? Who, who does that? It, it's not a what or an it. It's a who. The, the irony of God's judgment is what drives not only David's prayer, but the irony of God's judgment drives the main story of the Bible. The, the story that we all find ourselves in today and the story that really shapes and informs all of our prayers, the irony of God's judgment is exactly the story of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever considered this. Jesus, who is the great, great times a million grandson of David, is the king of the universe, who's born destitute. He's confident in the way that he addresses really powerful people, even, even kings and rulers. But he grew up in the sticks, uneducated. Jesus is the great respecter of women, even though he never married himself. He's our great older brother, even though he never had children himself. Everything about Jesus' life is ironic. But it's Jesus' death where the irony of God's judgment really, really shines. Because Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Jesus is hated and betrayed by the religious leaders of the Jews, even though he is the great prophet of the Jews and to the Jews. He's arrested and betrayed and sentenced by the Roman government, even though, as he tells Pilate, you would have no authority if it were not given to you by me. Jesus dies a broken man, even though he's the God of life. And in his death and in his burial... The forces of evil seem to have overcome Jesus, but to use David's words, their mischief returns upon their own head. We we know from the early church that one of the most popular ways to depict Jesus, one of the most popular images that Christians would paint in um, in their funeral burial places, in their homes, one of the most popular images is of Jesus as a fisherman. Not only because he is a fisher of men, But because in Jesus' death, he becomes the hook that evil swallows to its own demise. The mischief returns upon their own head, not only of the wicked, but of death and evil and of sin. And after three days, the Lord Jesus rises from the dead to an immortal body that will never die again. Do Do you recognize the irony of God's judgment? The way God judges the world is this. He does right. He does right by the wicked, not initially by living and bringing justice as a conquering king. God does the right thing by evil people by offering them mercy and taking the judgment into himself. God God does right by evil people by offering them mercy that they don't deserve. There's no way to draw a straight line from the evil that we do to the mercy and the forgiveness that God shows us. But that's how he does his thing. God, again to use the phrase, really gets off. It really delights him to forgive people. And in that way, showing them justice. Doing right by them. And and now that Jesus, the Son of God, has returned to heaven, a, a holiday we especially remembered this last week as we celebrated Ascension Day on Thursday. We remember that Jesus has returned to heaven and he is providentially ruling over all things. We especially remember how God has commanded all people to trust this really weird, ironic message and to turn our lives over to him. Again, the irony of Jesus, he he tells us that the only people who can save their lives are people who give up on him. That the only ones who end up ruling forever with him are the ones who in this life make themselves slaves. Everything about the good news of Jesus is super ironic. And, And do you see that, whoever you are, or whatever you've done, do you recognize that the only true God has done everything you need 
to be rescued from what you deserve and what I deserve. To give you an ironic judgment. A judgment not of punishment, but of life and of freedom. Friends, if you don't follow Jesus today, meditate. Meditate on the righteousness of God, that that it is right for God to judge our sins like he does. And meditate also on the gift that he gives to you and to me and to all who would trust in him. Meditate on God's judgments. And, And brothers and sisters, you who already follow Jesus, if you do follow him, can I invite you to worship? Can I invite you to meditate and to marvel that God would work through the most surprising ways to do right by you, to bring justice to you. That's what David's doing here. It's a very poetic way in five verses to say, ain't it funny how God acts sometimes? Not only in judging the wicked, but in saving all the wicked who would trust in him. That's, That's what David's getting at here in this last verse. Meditation's not the point. It's the means to the end. David, because he knows this God and belongs to him by faith, he just can't go on much longer without landing in the place meditation takes us. Meditation takes David and it takes us to verse 17, where we worship, where we experience and show gratitude. We, fourthly and finally, we know, we we pour out our hearts to God, we call on Him to do the right thing, we meditate on His judgment, we do this when we worship God for doing the right thing. It, it was an interesting discussion at, at staff meeting this week and uh, our devotion around this passage, looking at verse 17 and asking ourselves, I think there's kind of two scenarios here. One, David's maybe still right in the thick of it. This cush dude has not gotten justice yet. David's still in the middle of being slandered. Is David so confident that Cush is going to get God's justice that he's sort of just like, can I use the phrase, he names it and claims it? He knows God is going to do the right thing, and so he just preemptively says thank you. He's so confident that God will do the right thing. Is that what's going on? Or is it more like after verse 16, David kind of puts down the pen for a while. And at some point, days, weeks, maybe months or years pass, and when Cush does get what is right, Then David comes back and and picks up the pen and says, now the song is ready to be done. Now I've seen God do it. I I don't know which one of those happened. I don't know. I'm not convinced it really matters all that much. But what, what we must take away from this is the God who will do right by you, whoever you are, he he will so certainly do right by you that we who belong to Jesus through faith, we who have repented of our lives apart from him and now follow him, even in the depths of sorrow, even in the middle of great frustration, if he drags us kicking and screaming, we can't help but say thank you. We can't help it at some point. I I think one of my favorite models of this in all of history is a man, maybe you've never heard of, a man named Charles Albert Tindley. Let me tell you the story of Charles Albert Tindley and the way that he worshipped God for doing the right thing. Uh, Charles, I'll call him, never met the guy, but he's my brother. I'll meet him one day. Charles was born in 1851 to a father who was a slave and a mother who was a free woman. Um, Was never allowed access to school um, even after the end of the war and so when he eventually grew up, he was hired to be a church janitor in Philadelphia. And for those of us who have worked in the janitorial industry before, church janitors received no salary. So when we say hired, we're being a little generous. But Charles used the the time he had and the availability he had to teach himself first to read and then to read Greek and Hebrew. And after just a few years, Charles was ordained to be the pastor of the church where he had been the unpaid secretary, unpaid janitor, excuse me. And and, and his long time at this one church in Philadelphia, the church went from being a church of 130 African-American members to having 10,000 members of a variety of ethnicities, rich and poor, 
former slaves, always free. Dr. Tindley, he was eventually given an honorary doctorate, wasn't just oppressed. He didn't just experience injustice by racists when he was a kid. He was, he was treated wrongly as an older man by the same folks. They, they didn't like the way that in, in bringing the healing of the gospel to people, Dr. Tindley helped his members start their own businesses. He didn't like the way that he brought in others and, and also used his own experience to show them how to use their money in the way that they could purchase their own homes one day, something that in Philadelphia in the late 1800s never happened for black folks. They didn't like the way that he ministered his flock in that way. And they definitely didn't like when in the early 1900s, Dr. Tindley led a Christian protest against a film that came out. The, the film, you may have heard of it, is, it's called The Birth of a Nation. The, the plot of The Bir- of Birth of a Nation is simply this. Black folks are ignorant perverts, and the KKK are the heroes in the movie. Um, many people who profess to be Christians, including the president at the time, who held a private screening at the White House, many professing Christians loved the movie. And so Dr. Tinley met with other pastors around Philadelphia and led a protest march. And when they reached a certain point in the march, a mob descended on them, and Dr. Tinley was beaten within an inch of his life. He, praise God, he, he survived that attack. He died peacefully as an old man on my birthday, come to find out. 53 years before I was born, but my birthday, I'll take it. For all the injustice that Dr. Tinley experienced, what what he's best known for, especially by our brothers and sisters in the historic black church, is his songs. Dr. Tinley wrote some of the most well-loved gospel songs in our nation. And they are always, historians of church music make this note, his songs are always filled with joy. At the same time as they've got heart-wrenching stories in them too. For all the injustice Dr. Tinley experienced, his joy, his worship could not stay contained forever. It leaked out. Because he was someone, and maybe you're like this too, he was someone that God delivered not only from his own sins. God delivered Dr. Tinley from the sins that other people committed against him. They were very real, and they had a lasting power, but they did not define his life. If, if Dr. Tinley prayed Psalm 7, which he certainly must have, Dr. Tinley's version has all 17 verses, including the final one, praising God. Brothers and sisters, for all the ways that we have been grafted into Jesus and that we share in Dr. Tinley's story, for all of our own versions of that story, for all the ways that God has done right by us. Let's worship Him. Let's praise Him, not only now, but in the world to come. I'll invite the musicians to come forward too, and and we'll do just that. We will sing a very honest song as we come to the Lord at the table. We'll we'll confess not only is is the Christian life very difficult and, and troublesome, it's filled with stuff we didn't even choose for ourselves. We still sing with joy. We worship and give thanks to this God. And if you're someone who, maybe even despite yourself, has come to trust in this Lord Jesus yourself, you, you don't even know what you're signing up for, but you're in. You're all in. That you trust Him with your whole life. And, and trusting Him has turned your life to face not just yourself in your own ways, but you've turned to Him. You, you can't drop your sins before you come to Him. So you've come to Him with your sins and with your brokenness. If that's you and you've been baptized as a member of his church, publicly saying, I'm kind of a dummy, but Jesus evidently loves dummies, and I'm in. And if if you're not a member of our church, but you are a member in good standing with your local church, brothers and sisters, these tables are for you. They're not mine or our denominations. The Lord Jesus has set them for you. If you're not someone who follows Jesus this morning, we are so happy you're here. We're so glad to befriend you and to serve you. We want to know how to serve you better. We want to answer your questions we want, to be a, we want to be your friend. We want to be good neighbors to you, whether you follow Jesus or not. We love you, and the best thing we know to serve you would be for you to come to the Lord Jesus. And until you do, he, he tells us in Scripture that this table is not for you, not yet. So please feel free to remain in your seats while the rest of us come forward. We ain't judging you. We have no room to do that. But for all of you who do love and follow the Lord Jesus, 
Let me invite you now to stand and to sing. And at any point during the song, brothers and sisters, to come to Jesus at the table.